Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the She's Making an Impact podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Ngo. I'm really excited for you to listen to today's episode. Before we dive into that, have you left a review of the show yet? If you have not done so, would you please? That's what helps us really reach more people, make a greater impact. And um, when you do that, just take a screenshot before you hit submit, email it to clientcare at rachelandgum.com. And we'll make sure we send you a little thank you um, for taking the time to do that other thing have you shared the show with a friend if you've been listening for a while and you've been keeping it to yourself stop don't do that find a friend that you know would benefit from this um that's maybe looking to start a business or they want to create more passive income in their life share it with them okay so today's episode i was actually a guest on the copywriter club's podcast and i loved the conversation that we had it was way different than um, what we normally, what I normally get interviewed on. And so today you'll be hearing a lot about, you know, passive income, a big thing. We talk about Africa, the digital nomad lifestyle, the different investments that we're making, um, mindset, and a lot of things. But yeah, it's it's a really, really, really fun episode. So I'm like, can can I share this with my people? Yes. So you get to listen in on it. Um, take some notes and enjoy. I like to call myself an accidental entrepreneur. So I um, lived in Africa for a while, moved back and got my master's in social work. And when I graduated, I went to the, the top program in the country and I couldn't find a job. Um, even with my master's and my husband was starting a brand new business. Uh, we had a brand new baby. We ended up broke on food stamps, negative $400 in our checking account. And I was like, all right, so what are we going to do? Um, got to figure something out. And I was a part of a network marketing company at the time. And I saw other people having success and I was like, if they can do it, I can do it. I got to figure it out. So I failed forward, um, failed a lot. And eventually really understood how to use social media to grow that business back in, you know, 2012, 2013, and um, created a six-figure business within two years. And that was primarily in the beginning using Facebook and Instagram. I had 50,000 followers on Facebook, 20,000 on Instagram. And back then it was so easy to like post and get comments and make sales. Oh, like I, like, I would get thousands of comments on some posts. It was awesome. Um, then the logarithm changed and I was like, oh, got to figure something out. Um, that's kind of like the life of an entrepreneur. You got to pivot um, and figure something out because nothing is going to last or work forever. So I moved to my blog and Pinterest and I just started creating content, putting stuff up on Pinterest. And I did not have an elaborate strategy or anything like that. But I was like, we'll, we'll just kind of see what happens. And I noticed my traffic was increasing. And I was like, where are these people coming from? Is Facebook working again? Um, I looked at my Google Analytics and I had <clears throat> 34,000 people every month coming to that blog from Pinterest. And um, since then, uh, 1.8 million people have been on that blog, which is crazy. And so, I, you know, my email list was growing. I had 20,000 subscribers on my email list from Pinterest. And I started teaching my network marketing company, like people on my team and other teams, how I was using Pinterest to grow that business. And, you know, that company restructured. Again, nothing lasts forever. My income was cut in half. Um, and I was left thinking, okay, like I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm not in control. Um, the company is in control because they made the switch from, you know, DVDs to digital. And I was working harder and harder and harder and still nothing was working. So I was like, I have to do something on my own. So I hired a business coach, um, couldn't afford it, but figured it out. And, um, she helped me see Pinterest was kind of my sweet spot of this is how I can really serve entrepreneurs that are struggling on Facebook and Instagram. They need to generate new leads and sales on autopilot. And I can teach them how to do that. So we launched Pin With Purpose. That's my program, um, teaching entrepreneurs how to generate leads through Pinterest. And we've had over 2,000 students go through that program. And it has been wild to see them, you know, triple their sales in 60 days. And um, it's been a lot of fun. We've had the freedom. We lived in France for two years. Uh, we lived in Senegal the first six months of this year. My husband is coming back from Senegal today. I'm so excited. Um, and we've been able to take money from this business and then invest into other businesses. So my husband's been in Senegal setting up, um, you know, a chicken coop. We bought land and doing car rentals and all kinds of things with the plan to retire by 40. So that's the story in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for joining us for the podcast. That was an awesome episode. You know, that, 
we have covered okay you covered a lot of ground there and yeah. and we definitely want to come back to you know like uh for sure pinterest you know all the things that you're doing retire before 40 but before we do that i'm curious what took you to africa in the first place why did you know before all of this started how did you end up there Good question. So I played volleyball in college um, at the University of Illinois. I was on a fluoride scholarship and it was there that I became a Christian. And um, I was at this, we had all campus worship and I was at worship and it was like this Holy Spirit moment of God being like, you need to go to Africa. And I was like, huh, how is that going to work? I don't know anybody on the continent. I play volleyball. I can't take more than a week off. And it was like all these things kind of fell into place of I met my professor who intimidated the crap out of me. And I never would have gone to talk to her if my grandfather hadn't passed away. And she thought I was a dumb athlete that was lying to get out of taking the midterm. So I had to meet with her and she was like, what do you want to do? You're you're getting your degree in, you know, sociology. You're never going to get a job. And I told her I wanted to join the Peace Corps. And she's like, I can get you an internship in Africa. And I was like, huh, okay, but I play volleyball. How is that going to work? And at that time, I actually got injured. I um, tore cartilage in my rib cage that never healed. And so I was able to take six months and live in Kenya. And it completely transformed my life. Um, I came back, finished college, and then I wanted to go back to Africa and work on my French. And I chose Senegal. And that's where I met my husband. Um, took him back to America with me. And we've been all over the world since we've been married for 11 years now. Um, I think we've moved like 10 times in the past 11 years. It's been wild. And yeah, so that that's what took me to Africa in the first place. Let's talk about those lessons from Kenya and the six months, the life-changing six months. What were some specific lessons you learned that may show up in your business today? Uh, maybe you go back to those moments and think about it. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations because that's where the growth happens. I was so uncomfortable every single second of every day. I remember one um, instance in particular, like I had just gotten there and I needed to go out into the village and get food. Like I was hungry and I didn't have any food. Um, And as soon as I walked out, I was just so intimidated. I'm like this this white chick from the suburbs of Chicago in the middle of this village in Kenya. And there's like a hundred thousand people there. There's I think white five white people in the entire village. And so like you walk out and everyone just stares at you and I'm like, okay. And then people come up to you. And I was like, I was just so intimidated. And like, I had to learn how to get confidence to actually go out and live, you know? And so I would come in and I'd be praying over Ephesians where it talks about putting on the armor of God. And, you know, as I stepped out, I just get, got more confident to do more things. And so, you know, by the time I left, I had traveled all over Kenya. I think I've been to like every city. I took Matatus, which is like the public transportation to get everywhere. Um, Went whitewater rafting down the Nile, went to Lamu, spent a week there, um, which is an island off the coast of Kenya and Somalia. Went to Morocco, jumped off a mountain, um, went to Egypt, climbed Mount Sinai at sunrise, went scuba diving in the Red Sea. Just like these things that were on my bucket list. And I got over so many of those fears. And so when it came to business, I always think about like, what's the thing that kind of scares me and how can I lean into that and how can I pursue that? And so public speaking was one of the things that really (laughs) made me uncomfortable. And so I was like, okay, I got to sign up for Toastmasters. I'm going to become a fitness instructor. So I like have to put myself in that situation. Um, I have to, you know, go live, create YouTube videos, do a webinar. Those are all the things that back in the day made me uncomfortable. And now I'm in a place where it doesn't make me uncomfortable anymore. So I'm like, all right, what's my like next level of growth? But I think like the biggest lesson of Kenya was pursue discomfort because that's where growth happens. I came back a completely different person. I used to have so much anxiety of like fear of people looking at me and judging me. And it wasn't until I was in Kenya that I was like, people were never looking at me. Now they're looking at me. Um, yeah, it it was incredible. I miss it. I love it there. <laughs> I love I love this whole discussion. I have a daughter who's taking a gap year and her whole goal is to go to Africa. You know, yes, to- we need to talk about that. I can help her. <laughs> we, we should. We're gonna have to connect afterwards because yes. yeah, this is one of the things and she struggled with it because of COVID, you know, travel restrictions and all that. So it's kind of put some of her dreams on hold. But 
um, yeah, we, we definitely need to connect afterwards, Rachel, about how to do all of this stuff. So, um, and before we leave this part of your life, I'm also curious, you know, you, you mentioned you played as a volleyballer. Are there lessons from, you know, that sports experience that apply to your business today? Oh yeah. Um, a million. Um, wow. One big one is to visualize your success and to visualize it happening. And so we actually won the junior Olympics my senior year. That was like our big, big goal. I was an all American. I was like one of the top five best players in the country. We played in China. Um, I ended up playing in Italy and it was like, we busted our butts. We were the hardest working team in the country. That's why we won. Um, we were not the most talented. Like I would never consider myself the most athletic, most talented player by any means, but I had one of the strongest work ethics. I was the first person in the gym, the last person to leave. I did extra cardio. I was really strict, like with my diet. Um, and one of the things our coach taught us is like, we had quiet time before big matches when we were at qualifiers or, you know, nationals. And we would just be visualizing ourselves, like visualize yourself, get the kill, visualize yourself, getting the ACE, visualize yourself winning. And so I remember I'd be doing cardio and it'd be so hard and I wouldn't want to do it, but I do it anyways. Cause you don't do the things that you always feel like doing. You, you got to show up. You can't wait for motivation to come to you. You got to take action anyways. And so I'd be doing that cardio. It would be so hard. And I would just be visualizing myself standing on the podium, then putting the gold medal around my neck because we won. And I saw it over and over and over again in my, in my mind. So when it actually happened in real life, it was one of the wildest experiences because I had rehearsed it and I already saw it. Um, that was one of the biggest ones. Discipline, obviously, like I like the club I played at, it was kind of like boot camp military style of you're very, very disciplined. Like we're 13, 14 years old. And if our bags were not lined up perfectly without gaps in between the bags, like we'd be doing sprints or, you know, I left my workout binder in the weight room one time and I had to run a hundred flights of stairs after a four hour practice. Well, um, <laughs> yeah. So like, you better believe I never left my, my workout binder again. Um, attention to detail was a big thing. Attention to detail and teamwork. Like how can you rely on your team and not a hundred percent on yourself? There's like so many, but those are some of the ones that come to my head right now. How does that show up in your business today? Let's go with attention to detail and teamwork. How, yeah, how is that present in the business you've built today? Attention to detail of looking at what are the little things that can help us increase conversions? What are the little things that we can do to make a difference for our clients? Um, like the little details of they sign up, okay, instead of like waiting for onboarding or anything, like we have a solid onboarding process in place to really support them. Um, like sending them little gifts or letters or books or stuff like that. Um, attention to detail that way. Teamwork. I would not have this business if it were not for our team. Um, I do not work that many hours. I, I'm really focused on family first and having a lot of fun and taking care of myself. Um, so I work probably no more than 20 hours a week. Um, and I take Fridays off for fun Friday. <laughs> like my husband and I are getting a couple's massage tomorrow, um, which wouldn't happen if it weren't for the power of team and learning how to delegate effectively. So as you were talking about the, the process of sort of reinventing your business, you mentioned that moment when you had negative $400 in your checking account. And I, I think that probably resonates with at least part of our audience. Maybe they don't have negative checking accounts, but the struggle, you know, and, and showing up and feeling like things aren't moving and, you know, just trying to figure out like, what's the thing that's going to kick this over the hump. And I'm curious if maybe you can just talk about that moment in time, how you felt and what it was that you did in order to, I, I know you, you started, you know, doing things in your business, but mentally, what was it that helped you get through that? I made a decision that I refused to stay where we are. I remember pushing my son in the stroller and we were going from pawn shop to pawn shop selling stuff to get our bank account out of the negative. And I remember like I was trying to sell jewelry and them turning it down because they're like, this is only worth like 20 bucks. This is costume jewelry and just feeling completely deflated. And then looking at my son and being like, you are not being raised in this kind of environment. Like I refuse. And so a lot of times people might feel 
again, like deflated. And instead of telling myself a story of like, well, this is the best it's going to get, you know, I just kind of looked around and I was like, what can I create out of this? And I saw a program that came out that was teaching social media, which I knew I really needed to grow my business. And it was $450 a month for six months. And that was like a million dollars a month at the time. Like it was so expensive, but I had that feeling in my gut of, I have to do this. And I'm a big believer, like you got to follow that gut feeling. So when I had that feeling, I was like, okay, now how? I didn't tell myself a story of I can't afford it. I kind of looked around and I was like, how can I afford this? How can I make this happen? And so I was like, hmm, I can sell our TV. I can sell our dining room table. Like we don't need a dresser. Like that can go. We sold our Xbox. I sold anything that I could so that I could do that program. And it was that program that completely transformed my business. Because when you invest, you are invested. I was the best student. I showed up. I did everything they told me to do. And I saw, you know, it went from $20,000 a year to $100,000 a year within two years. And I attribute most of that success to that specific program that I went through. It radically transformed my business. And I think a lot of people, when they're struggling, they just tell themselves a story of like, like a thing that could come, like come a coaching program or something that could help them. They tell themselves a story of, I can't afford it. And that keeps them stuck. And they stay small instead of looking around and asking themselves a question of how can I, because money's everywhere. If you look around, like you can find the money, pretty much everyone that I've learned from, they didn't start off successful. They started off broke. Um, I think about like Tony Robbins and Dean Graciosi and Danny Johnson and Shanda Sumter, all these people that I've learned from, they started off broke, but they figured it out because they asked themselves, how, how can I do this? And then you just figure it out, you know? Let's fast forward to 2012, the year um, when you hit your six figures within two years. You know, when I hear that, I'm like, that sounds great. I I want that. Like a lot of our listeners might want that as well. Can you talk about the ingredients, you know, the combination that really helped you get to that six figure mark? Investing in myself and being incredibly consistent. That's one of my superpowers is the power of consistency. So that program that I learned social media from, she said, you need to post every hour on the hour on Facebook from 9am to 9pm Eastern standard time. So I did like, over and over and over again. And there was not me, you know, missing a day. I remember specifically, like I was in the hospital giving birth to my son and it wasn't a surprise, you know, I'm like 40 weeks pregnant. So I scheduled out my post using Hootsuite or whatever it was at the time. (laughs) And so like, I'm in the hospital giving birth. I still am posting on Facebook because I'm like, so focused on, I gotta be consistent. I gotta be consistent. Um, so that is one of the things that you have, it has to happen. Like you can't just show up when you feel like it every once in a while, you've got to show up. And that's like, we do that to this day. Like we just had our 300th podcast episode go out. We have not missed a single episode. I have not missed emailing my list since I started this business. Like every single week, every week I've had an email go out. That's through having a baby. That's through going through a pandemic. That's through moving overseas multiple times. <laughs> um, it's just, you have to make that commitment to show up for your audience. And consistency is one of the big keys there. Yeah, this is something that I'm personally really interested in, not just, you know, your approach to this, but, you know, my own personal discipline. And it seems like when we talk to athletes or former athletes on the podcast, like they seem to have this thing that I don't know if it's built through athletic competition and practice and all of that stuff, but, you know, if, if you were not an athlete or if you were talking to somebody who doesn't have that background, what advice would you give them in order to build personal discipline so that they can show up consistently and they can do the things that start uh, moving their business forward? Yeah, I would say like the discipline of having a routine. So I'm thinking about like the routine of getting ready for practice, the routine of showing up to practice every day and how I have that in my life now. So I think about like I wake up early. I was up at, you know, 515 this morning. I'm typically up between... 4 30 and 6. I don't set an alarm, but I just, I go to bed early enough. So I get enough sleep and I wake up before the baby. And I'm like, I have my routine and I like, I live by my routine. So I'm like in bed early. And then I wake up, I read the Bible, I pray, I meditate, I visualize. We go for a walk. We walk for about 40 minutes and it's still dark out. I literally just bought a headlamp so I can look out for (laughs) snakes and armadillos and alligators. Um, And we like, I do that because otherwise it's going to be too hot and then I'm not going to want to feel like it. But if I want to 
you know, feel my best, perform my best, show up as my best self. That's kind of like the routine and the discipline that needs to happen. Um, yeah, I would say like have a morning routine. If you haven't read the miracle morning or, you know, something like that, do that and have a set morning routine and you don't have to wake up at five if you don't want to, but I would wake up before the children. So you have a little bit of time where you can focus on your mindset. So you show up strong. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, I think that's a great, great advice around, okay, work on the morning routine. You know, that's a great book to read. I wonder if this is more of a mindset shift, even in order to be able to create that routine and stick to the routine and then ultimately have consistency and growth in your business. Uh, is there a mindset shift that we need to experience before we even get to that point or anything that you had to go through in order to really step in and be like, I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. I'm committed. Cause I think that's where we struggle. It's like the mindset shift to get to that point. Don't have it be all or nothing. Don't tell yourself you have to be perfect because there are days, I would say I do my morning routine like 90% of the, I always go for a walk. That's like non-negotiable. But like waking up before Gabrielle and getting like my prayer meditation, all that stuff in, I would say it happens 90% of the time. The other percentage, percentage maybe I just needed more sleep. Um, so give yourself grace. Like my goal is to work out six days a week. Does that mean I work out for an hour every time? No. Sometimes it's like, all right, I got 15 minutes to get on the bike. Like I got to make this happen. And it's that consistency instead of having an all or nothing mentality. A good book to support people with that is The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Um, just get rid of the all or nothing mentality. Give yourself grace and tell yourself, I'm just going to do five minutes. Like I don't have to go for an hour. I'll just do five minutes. And then that's how you start to build a habit and show up day after day after day. It doesn't have to be an hour. It could be five minutes. I love all the book recommendations too, Rachel. Yeah. You're like, you're like I read a lot. a lot of my favorites. <laughs> so, in fact, my son just came home with a uh, compound effect. He's like, have you ever heard of this? I'm like, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. It's a fantastic book. So yeah, um, it's great. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to shorten our conversation about mindset and discipline and all that stuff, but I am really curious about the Pinterest side of your business and the impact that that's had because like you said you know going from this consistent posting to like millions of visitors to your site like that seems incredible and especially for someone like me who you know sees my my kids playing on pinterest and and i'm saying playing because that's what it feels like to me like it doesn't even in some ways feel like a serious business tool so talk to us about pinterest and what we would need to do in order to make that, you know, a lead generation tool. So think of it like a visual search engine, kind of like a visual Google. Okay. That's the easiest way to describe it. And so you got to treat it like a search engine. It's not a social media platform. And if you get niched down enough, that's when you have the ability to show up and to dominate long-term. That fitness blog that I created still has thousands of people coming to it every single month, and I haven't touched it in four years. Four, like imagine being able to get traffic and make sales and build your email list four years after you actually did the work. That just blows my mind. Um, one of the biggest things you need to understand is a search engine, and you got to niche down. And so some of my most popular blog posts that still generate traffic, um, how to do intermittent fasting for women and endomorph diet tips for women. Like it's so niche, so specific. And that's the thing. Like I start, I was creating content and I was all over the place. I was like, I'm going to help people with everything. And when I looked at my Google analytics, I saw my content that was about intermittent, intermittent fasting and keto was the content that was getting the most traffic. And so I just kind of asked myself, Hmm, what if I niched down and only focused on that? And that's when things took off is when I became known as that go-to expert and people came from Pinterest and they're like, Oh my goodness. She has like a free keto meal plan. She has a, a keto ebook that I can buy. And you know, when I launched my ebook, I actually crashed my website because I had so many people that wanted to buy it. And that's the power of niching down and doing it correctly through Pinterest. Could you break it down for us with another example? Maybe it, it could be an example of a copywriter and how a copywriter could just think through how to use Pinterest and create content for Pinterest. I mean, we could even use Rob Marsh as an example. For his copyright yeah, Rob, Rob on Rob on Pinterest, that would be uh, that'd be awesome. 
And, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek because like, like I said, I barely know anything other than my kids play on Pinterest. Okay. So one of the things that you can actually do is to open up Pinterest and just start typing in, um, different long tail keywords. So a long tail keyword is like a short phrase that someone might search. A, a, one keyword would be like weight loss, right? Or copywriting. A long tail keyword might be how to do copywriting. So it depends on like what kind of copywriting you're doing or what you, they want to attract. But if I do how to do copywriting, that pops up as a long tail keyword. And so that's an example of something that they could use. So when you upload a pin, you include that long tail keyword in the pin description. Um, and that's one of the ways that you can show up. And so it just kind of depends on who they want to attract and get inside the head of that person they want to attract and think, okay, when they're on Pinterest, what are they searching for? And can I show up as that person to solve that problem for them? And obviously this is a visual medium, right? So how do I connect those keywords to images? What should I be thinking about? Is it pictures of me? Is it quotes? What, what should I be doing there? So good homework for you to do is actually open up Pinterest and start scrolling and see what kind of pins stop your scroll. Cause that's what you want to create. And typically when I have people do this, the things that stop the scroll, it's a big, like it has big, bold text on it. It doesn't necessarily have to have an image. It can, these are things that you can test, um, you know, Pinterest and marketing in general, you got to test and see what works. It has big, bold text that's easy to read. We call it like a headline. So we test our headlines out as a copywriter. It should be pretty easy to write a compelling headline that wants to stop people's scroll. It has a bold color. So we use red um, strategically. Um, you could use like pink or blue. Just think about like a bold color that'll grab their attention. Um, those are the biggest things. And it's on brand. So if you go to like our Pinterest account, you'll see we definitely have our pins on brand. So we have our logo on there and we also have a call to action. So, and then you could also test out other things too. Like you could test out video pins. When you use, we use Canva to create our pins, which is so easy. You don't have to be um, like a designer or anything because I am not. Um, they have easy templates that you can use and you could test out animated pins, video pins. And those are fun to create because they stand out a little bit more in the feed. Okay. This is basic, basic question because <laughs> Similar to Rob, this is not a place I hang out often, at least for marketing purposes for our business. So are, are we focusing on lead magnets as I'm looking at all the different pop-ups for copywriting? When I type copywriting in, it looks like these are mostly lead magnets or are we sending people directly to landing pages and selling? Um, do you have tips around like the best way to guide them through a funnel? Yep. So I want you to think about like the psychology of the pinner and what they're going through. And so when they're on Pinterest, they're searching for something that's going to help them solve a problem. They don't know you yet. They're cold traffic. And so I would send them to a blog post where you're adding value. So it could be a how-to post, a tutorial post, a list post, or something like that, where it's solving a problem. And then within that post, you have a call to action for them to get on your email list and go even further. So it could be like a content upgrade or something like that that's going to dive in even deeper to that post that they just read. They're going to be way more likely to actually take action on that as opposed to if you send them from Pinterest directly to a lead magnet or a sales page. And Rachel, as I think about doing this, are there any niches or industries or markets that maybe wouldn't be a good fit for Pinterest? And, and the reason I ask is a lot of the clients that I personally would write for are in the SaaS space. So it's software, technology, that kind of stuff. Uh, Pinterest doesn't feel like it's a place where that person is hanging out, but I could be completely wrong because obviously they may be there looking for other things, you know, recipes for marshmallow pie or, you know, images for something else. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, should some people avoid Pinterest or is it, you know, good for everyone? I've never seen a business that I would say, no, you shouldn't be on Pinterest. Like I've even spoken at real estate conferences, teaching realtors how they can use Pinterest. Um, one of the things too, to remember is that pins show up on Google images. And so even if you think your person isn't on Pinterest, they are like, I've seen my husband, my husband, a man from West Africa that did not grow up with the internet was on Pinterest searching for stuff. <laughs> um, so if he's on Pinterest, everyone is, um, but they're on Google for sure. So I, yeah, I haven't seen a niche or an industry that I would say they shouldn't use Pinterest. So before we, we wrap and move on uh, from 
Pinterest. What are some other mistakes that we should avoid? Let's just say like, I'm listening. I, I am listening. This does sound like a great opportunity. I want to jump in and test it. What other mistakes should I avoid? Being too broad. So we talked about being niche. Don't be too broad. Um, don't be afraid to add value. So don't be afraid like with your, your content to add value. Like some people are, are, they have that scarcity mindset. If I add too much value, then why would they buy from me? It's when you add value that they're going to think, wow, what else can I learn from this person? Like we've sold 10,000, $20,000 clients that found me on Pinterest. Um, and it's because they learned something and they're thinking, wow, what else can I learn from this person? So that's one of the big ones. And then the other one is going for the sale too soon. So your the whole goal of Pinterest is to use it to build your email list. And then through your email list, you can market your your offer. So don't go for the sale right away. And to be clear, this isn't something that, you know, if we're going to take it seriously, that we can dabble in like, a, you know, a couple of posts now and then taking a month or two off and then a couple of posts is probably not a great strategy. It's not a strategy for anything. You can't dabble and expect to see results in anything that you do. You got to go all in. Let's shift and talk a little bit about where you are today, what your business looks like today, because I definitely, you know, when you mentioned, I do not work that many hours. And then I think you said 20 hours a week. That that grabs my attention. I, I want that. So can you just talk a little bit about um, the overall picture of your business? Do you have a team today? What does your team look like? And what are some of those offers in your core business? So our team looks like we have Ariana, who is our part-time OBM business manager. Lizzie's our social media manager. Michelle does customer service. Helen is our head coach within Activate. Activate is our group coaching program that we have scaled. Um, so instead of me trading time for money, we have a program that actually has other coaches that have, are you know former students that are crushing it in their business that are supporting our students. So we have, I think, four or five coaches within Activate w- that are being led by our head coach, Helen. Um, we have a sales team as well and someone doing our Facebook ads and someone else doing Pinterest management as well. So that's the team. Oh, and we have um, Julie doing a lot of the tech behind the scenes stuff as well. Um, as far as our offers, digital courses. So pin with purpose is our signature program. We have smaller offers that are, you know, anywhere from $47 to $97. And then activate is our flagship program. It's, um, around $12,000 for that one. And it's a year long program. And then we also do Pinterest management as well. And how do you coordinate everything? Does everybody just know what they're doing or do you guys, you know, meet every week? Uh, you know, how does, how do you disseminate the ideas that you have for everybody else to be working on? Um, so we meet about every week or every other week and we use Voxer a lot and we have systems. And so Ariana, our OBM, she is a systems person. And so she has helped our team really systematize everything. So we have an SOP for everything in our business. So it is very systematized. So I can just say, hey team, we're doing this webinar. We're doing it Wednesday. Um, And then kind of the wheels are moving and we already have the entire project broken down into Asana. We notify, you know, our ads manager and then they get to work on that. So I pretty much get to just show up for that webinar and deliver. And that's kind of my goal. I look at what are the things that only I can do? And then how can I lean into that and focus on that? So I don't have to be the person showing up and, you know, editing the podcast. I don't have to be the person responding to emails. I don't have to be the person doing private coaching inside of Activate. How can I scale it so it takes me out of that role? Yeah. And I I love that you've scaled. And I think that's what a lot of copywriters are interested in as well. It's tough though, to go from, you know, let's say where you started solopreneur and then to get to where you are today. I'm just wondering where, where did you struggle the most on that path of letting go and really kind of stepping into the visionary CEO of your business? Where did you struggle? And then how did you work through that struggle? I think in the beginning, um, making that first hire, which was Ariana, because she was expensive. (laughs) I think she was at the time like $45 an hour. Um, I remember her telling me like, I'll treat, like, I know your business is your baby and I'll treat it like that. Um, So that gave me a lot of confidence and knowing I had the right person. So I think you got to spend time making sure you're hiring the right people and putting them into the right roles. So we've had Ariana, Lizzie, Michelle, 
Helen, they've been on our team for like almost since the very beginning. Um, so we have great people that we all, you know, enjoy working together and we know each other and we work together really well. So Ariana even like creates a lot of copy for me because she understands my voice so much. Lizzie creates a lot of my Instagram posts for me because she knows my voice so well. Um, when it comes to like giving up control, one of the things um, I attended Global Leadership Summit and Craig Groeschel, he's um, the pastor of one of the most successful churches, if not the most successful church in America, said that you can either have growth or you can have control, but you can't have both. And that always kind of stuck with me. I'm like, okay, I got to like let go of the control a little bit if I want to see growth. And if someone can do something 80% as good as I can, I can let go of it. Um, and then John Maxwell has been another big piece of, you know, just me learning and growing as a leader of teaching duplication. So like first I do it, you watch, then we do it together, then you do it, I watch, then you do it and you teach someone else. And just learning like the power of duplication so I can get out of it. And how can I make things really, really clear, documented, create those SOPs so I don't have to be the one doing that thing. You're talking my language here, right? <laughs> or, or, or maybe you're, t you're telling me all the things that I need to be doing as opposed to uh, things that we do. But um, so uh, I wonder about, you know, baseline systems as you've created these systems in your business. Uh, a lot of a lot of copywriters who are listening maybe don't even have their first system set up. So I'm curious where you would start if you, you know, what are the two or three systems that you absolutely need to have in your business to help it to grow and to be more effective? Well, you got to manage your time. So manage your calendar, Google Calendar, huge. Um, I started off using Trello to like manage myself. But as we grew the team, we moved over to Asana. Um, that way you can tag people in those projects. So that would be a big one as well. Um, communication, we use Voxer for all of that. Um, I try to stay out of email as much as humanly possible because that's just a tool of procrastination. Um, so manage your time. So make sure, you know, you're using Google Calendar, you're using a planner and you know what you should be doing and have that overall vision of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then working with your team within Asana. I think those are like, if you have those two things dialed down, you're going to do really good. All right. This is where I'm going to get selfish in the interview. And I'm just I'm going to ask some questions because I'm curious about the coaches in your program and how you've brought other coaches into your program. You mentioned they were former students. That's something that I know we're interested in doing. Definitely a lot of mindset, you know, issues around that. But how has that worked for you? What are some steps for anyone listening who also wants to start to scale and add other team members to the coaching element? Oh, it has been a game changer because I used to feel like I had to show up every day inside of the Facebook group and to be there. Um, and now that we have, you know, full-time, part-time coaches in the program, it takes a lot of that responsibility off my shoulder so I can take a week off and be with my husband and all the things I want to do. Like you created your business to have freedom, not to create another job for yourself. And so when you're building out your business and your offers, always think like, how can I scale this so I get out of it? Um, so the first person was Helen. And it's funny, I actually created a video that I put on YouTube and I was teaching, um, you know, my audience, how to use Trello for their business. And I showed how I like had goals set up for the upcoming year of how I wanted to have activate scale with hired coaches. And Helen literally just sent me a message, Rachel, can I be one of your coaches? Like, I love this program. I want to work with you. And she has been incredible. Like I trust Helen so much. She's been such an integral part of the growth and success of that program. And so me and her work really closely together. She knows me. She knows like my vision of what we're doing together. And she's the one responsible for hiring other coaches and training them inside of the program. And so she's kind of looking at, all right, who has done such a great job and who could we bring on board? So we kind of work together in terms of that. And then she has different checkpoints that she has set up. So when it comes to, you know, like hiring the right person, you want to make sure that they support the way. So like they think differently than you. So like I'm the visionary and then Helen is very, and Ariana, like these, these people on our team are very detail oriented. And so I come with like, we're going to do this. And then they come back with a list of questions. Okay. What about this? What timing? What's this going to look like? Like really specific. And so you want to make sure you're bringing on people that really understand those details and they think differently than you. So they balance you out as well. Um, 
yeah, Helen has done such a good job of like having different checkpoints. We have um, surveys for our students to see how the coaches are doing. Um, we didn't have all of this at once, you know, when we launched the program, I think if anything is perfect, when you launched it, you waited too long to launch it. And so we've had this program for a couple of years now, and it continues to evolve and get better as time goes on. While you're talking about developing programs and courses, I'm curious about your approach. Obviously you've done it several times. There are people listening who would love to do their own courses, whether it's in copywriting or whether it's something industry specific. Do you have just a few tips for somebody who's thinking about doing a course, where they should start and you know how to maximize their first effort. Do not create the course until you have sold it would be thing number one. I think I see so many entrepreneurs, they spend months creating and perfecting a course and then they launch it to crickets and it's really sad. Um, so what I would do is pre-sell it. That's what I did with like every program that I've created. I've launched it, sold it, and created it with my students. That way I know I'm not teaching over their head. Um, that's one of the biggest things. And just listen to your audience. Another good book. <laughs> I'm giving you all the books. Um, Ask, Ask by Ryan Levesque. And so the reason I was able to crash my website and sell out that ebook, um, that was like one of my very first offers is because I asked my audience what they wanted, what they needed, um, what they wanted to see inside the program. They helped me design like the cover for it. They helped me edit the book. And so when I launched it, they were ready, they were waiting and it was everything that they wanted to see inside the program. Um, so don't like be sitting at home by yourself trying to think of what you should create. See if you can work with your audience, do some market research, ask them what they want, deliver it for them um, and create it with them. Let's go back to your schedule. I'm clearly hooked on your 20 hour week schedule. So yes. <laughs> I, I can't let it go. Um, and I love that you said, you you know, you show up when you need to show up and teach on a webinar. Uh, can you just talk through that? You've talked through your morning routine, but what else do you do during the week? Yeah. So I'm actually, I have my calendar open right now so we can go through this. Um, so Mondays, I typically don't have a ton on my calendar. Um, usually it's more of like meeting with our sales team and planning out the week and getting like creative stuff done. So it might be creating content, um, recording podcast episodes, that kind of thing. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is when I batch any podcast interviews, coaching calls, webinars, anything like that. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays are free days. So, you know, tomorrow I'm doing posture therapy and getting a couple's massage. Um, I have repeating things on my calendar. So every morning from nine to 10, I have that blocked off as my workout time. I don't schedule anything typically before 11 a.m. And so Michelle manages my calendar and she knows she can book podcasts and other calls between 11 and 2.30 Eastern time, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's very specific on what fits my schedule. I also have power hours, like time where I can sit down, like what needs to happen. So maybe I'm like batching emails for the next couple of weeks. Maybe I'm working on like an affiliate launch that I'm a part of. I have power hour repeating on my calendar, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 10 to 11 Eastern. And so anything that needs to be repeated, I have it repeated. Um, and I just make sure I block up that time. I'm filling up my cup and putting myself first before I schedule anything else. Um, that's pretty much it. And I always make sure I'm working when the kids are at school there. I am picking up Gabrielle by three o'clock. So I'm done by three. I don't have anything on my calendar. Um, after that time, does that help? That's, yeah. Yes. Yes. It <laughs> Definitely helps. And um, Rachel, you're in Africa now, right? No, we actually came back um, over the summer. My husband has been there the past three months and he's coming back today. He's on the airplane right now and I'm so excited. Um, we moved there in, the day after Christmas and we came back for the summer with every intention to go back <laughs> to Senegal. And when we came, my son was just like having so much fun in the neighborhood with his friends and all the camps and stuff that they just didn't have in Senegal. So we decided to stay. And then my husband's going back and forth managing the, the businesses that we have over there. Okay, cool. Well, I, I mean, that kind of leads to my next question, which is, you know, you have 
you've lived in France, you've lived in Senegal. Now you're, you know, in the States, like just the, the business that you've built has been able to support you to do this anywhere. And again, I think a lot of people sort of like that. Kira and I have both talked about moving overseas at yeah, some do point it. <laughs> in the near future and uh, something that I've done in the past with my family. And so would you have any advice for copywriters who want to be doing the same kind of thing? You know, how do you become location independent? Well, create a business that's generating income where you don't have to trade time for money and you don't have to have your butt in one spot. So think about, all right, what can I create? Is it a program? Is it a coaching offer or whatever that is? So I can be anywhere. Um, have that vision of what you want to do. So I actually wrote in my journal, I, I'm a big fan of writing down goals. And I wrote this down in like 20... 14, maybe that we live in France. And that was before we had connections. We were living in Lake City, Florida at the time. And I just wrote it down like it would be wouldn't it be so cool if this happened and get yourself like in that state, like wouldn't it be crazy cool if this happened? And that's what I wrote down. And then it was like a year later, we were living in France and it was such a cool experience. Um, I miss it so much. Maybe we'll buy a house there, do an Airbnb and we can go over the summers. Um, but create that vision of what do you want your life to look like? I wrote out like, what does my perfect day look like? What does my perfect schedule look like? And I now have my perfect day. Um, like, because I was very intentional in creating my business around what that looks like. A lot of times we get like lost into the business and then it takes over our lives. You gotta be really intentional of what do you want it to look like? What's that vision that you have for your life and then create it. Yeah. I'm working on, our family is working on a, a move to France. And ah! so I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to you with some questions yes! about that. <laughs> of course. Uh, so I think, you know, listening to this interview, being a part of this interview, it's, there's so much that you're doing right. I know it wasn't an overnight change in your business, but I'm just curious, like, what do you, what do you struggle with these days in your business? Um, because it sounds like things are going so well. What is the struggle at the level that you're at right now? Struggle would be, let's see, we hired a sales director that did not work out. Um, and I think I kept him on for too long and, you know, he was overpaid. So that was one of the struggles. Um, and as we brought him on, like managing cash flow, as we had a lot more expenses going out to scale that part of our business, that was a struggle. Um, what else? I think I actually hit a point where I was over automating too. And I felt like almost out of touch with my students and out of touch with my audience. And that was specifically last year when Gabrielle was a baby, because I took off the first five months of her life just to be like mom and focus on her. So I think I, you know, I love automation and I love systems. So I think I over automated and over systematized. And I think there's power in actually being like in the trenches with your audience um, every once in a while. Hmm. What else? Those are the big things that I'm thinking about. Like I, of course, always have challenges and struggles, but I think I look at them differently of like, oh, that sucks that that happened. What did I learn from it? What was like, what was the growth in the lesson from it? So like doing a launch or doing a webinar and just the offer didn't land the way I thought it was going to. And just being curious instead of saying like, oh, I failed. I suck. I'm terrible. Like I, we didn't get the results that we wanted. I'm just like curious. I'm like, huh, I wonder why that didn't land. Like what did I do wrong or what could I learn or what could I have changed? So next time we do it, it's better. Um, so I think just the mindset around those struggles is huge of you didn't fail, you know, like you just need to learn and do it differently next time. So Rachel, before we started recording, you mentioned your goal of retiring before you're 40. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another topic that uh, is really interesting. Obviously you've got a very successful business, but uh, that's not the only thing you're relying on to get you to that retirement. Will you talk a little bit about your plan and how you are, you've, basically become an investor in, you know, different businesses, different things that you're doing? Oh, yeah. I love this topic. So basically, we're taking the money that we're making from this business and investing as much as we possibly can. We live pretty cheap. I actually, it was really funny. I created a video when we were um, in Senegal of you know, I, it was a Facebook ad or something. And I had someone comment on that video of like, you think if she was making millions through her blog, she could at least afford nice curtains. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, 
<laughs> we lived cheap so we can like we like think a good book that we wrote was the millionaire next door and we're like we are not flashy we drive a 2007 car that still runs perfectly and so we make sacrifices to have that vision so we invest in you know the stock market and index funds and different things there but we're also taking a big part of our money and investing in africa so we have two different plots of land that we have purchased um, we bought four cars in America that we have shipped over to do car rentals. So we bought cars at auctions in America for pretty cheap ones that have, you know, been in wrecks or had like mon- minor damages and the parts to fix them up and then ship them over to Senegal, got them fixed up and then putting them up for car rental. Um, we are doing rental arbitrage where we're renting an apartment or a house and then re-renting it on Airbnb. Um, and then the land that we bought, my husband is building a chicken coop there. So we're actually planning on being able to sell 75,000 eggs per month with that. <laughs> a lot of eggs. <laughs> a lot of eggs. They, it's crazy because they don't do a lot of agriculture in Senegal. So they import a lot of their foods. And when you go to the supermarket, they're always running out of eggs. Um, so that's, you know, he's also growing like okra and peanuts and, mangoes and all 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 other kinds of stuff so it's been pretty cool to see you know the people we've been able to employ through that and um also when that building is done it should be finished and we'll have the chickens in there um by january to see some more cash flow come in that way when you said chicken coop i'm thinking like 12 chickens no whatever. this is not no no no, no this is not a coop this is this it is, is i think different. five thousand chickens something like that yeah Okay. Well, I love, I love this entrepreneurial um, focus in your business. I guess the question is like, how do you know when an idea is worth pursuing? Because so many of us have all these ideas and clearly you've, you've spotted these opportunities and these problems and you've jumped in to fix them. Um, How do you decide when it's worth pursuing and when it's not worth pursuing? It's funny. I was actually just thinking about this of like, you're never going to always have a home run. And I was actually thinking about the Kardashians. Um, (laughs) And (laughs) like, have you seen all the different businesses and things that they have tried in the past? And a lot of them did not work out. You know, it's like, uh, like the Kylie lip kit finally took off and, you know, Kim's makeup line took off, but they did so many other things before that, that did not work. And so who knows if the chicken coop might not be like the home run that gets us, you know, to where we want to be, but we're going to try different things and we're not, we're being really wise with our investments. So we're not taking on debt. And we did a lot of research too. So like our original plan was to buy land in Dakar and to create um, an apartment complex and rent it out. And as we're, you know, we talk to a lot of people, like we try to run our lives and our business through the book of Proverbs. There's a lot of wisdom in the book of Proverbs of, you know, got to find wise counsel. So we looked at who's doing this. What does this look like? How much is it going to cost us? And then as we're looking at, okay, to buy 0.06 of an acre, like a tiny amount of land is going to cost us over a hundred thousand dollars in Dakar. And then we're going to have to take out a loan at the bank at 8% interest and be in debt. And like, so we looked at that opportunity and we're like, huh, is like, is that like, yeah, we'll be able to generate cash flow, but how long is it going to take for us to recoup that investment? So we looked at a lot of different things and we've been patient. Um, we've been sitting on a lot of cash for a couple years now, just waiting for the right opportunity. And my husband has done so much research. We've talked, we've talked to a lot of people. Um, we've hired mentors, you know, he found someone that was doing the chicken coop business and, done a lot of research there. So it wasn't like we found this thing, all right, let's go all in and do it. It's we've waited, we've been patient, we've talked to people um, to see what would be the wisest use of the money that we're sitting on right now so we can invest it and then multiply it. My last question, I've been wanting to ask you the entire interview, uh, whitewater rafting down the Nile. Can you just tell me, you know, from, from that experience, maybe what surprised you the most about that whitewater rafting experience down the Nile? Oh man, it was hard. Um, It was, it was a full, it was a full two day trip. Um, 
that I was the leader and I had the most experience. So it was me and um, my boyfriend at the time that were in the front leading the entire thing because we had the most experience, which I did not expect um, to be so sore by day two of, you know, being at the front of the boat of um, I don't think we flipped over once. And I'm kind of shocked by that with how crazy some of the rapids were. Um it was crazy when we got there. It like so we were camping out in Uganda and we had a tent and like the rain in Uganda during rainy season is insane. So it was like a downpour and um we were like taking buckets trying to get the rain out of the tent. And then we're taking um they have motorcycles as taxis. So we're taking the motorcycles and in the rain, two of my friends completely wiped out on the motorcycle into the mud. I think just like be open to adventure of you never know what's going to happen um, and just embrace, embrace the journey and have fun along the way. That, I love hearing your story from, you know, where you started to where you are now. And I'm curious, where are you going from here? What's next? Ooh, I have a vision of, you know, us retiring by 40, being able to be incredibly generous. We have a nonprofit in Senegal that, um, we're really working on, you know, helping kids get educated there. And my husband's huge passion is riding horses. And so being able to purchase an equestrian property so he can have his business there, uh, you know, the nice ones are like a million dollars. And so we're just, again, being wise with our, our money and I want him to be able to ride and have that freedom. Um, so that will be amazing and such a good feeling. Well, Rachel, I, I still have so many questions I want to ask you. We'll have to bring you back again to continue the conversation. But in the meantime, where can our listeners go if they want to connect with you or learn more about your programs? Yeah. So if you want to learn more about Pinterest, I suggest joining my free Pinterest masterclass. If you just go to freepinterestclass.com, I'll be there and teaching you my five-step strategy to doubling your leads and sales with Pinterest. So freepinterestclass.com. And then if you want to connect with me on the podcast, we have the She's Making an Impact podcast as well. Well, thank you, Rachel, for showing up. I feel really motivated, inspired. So I, I got so much out of this interview. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me.